Some of you are freaking out. Did I, what did I miss? All right. We wanted to make it a surprise. Uh, that, uh, we wanted to be like the very first Christmas. I mean, they weren't expecting that. Um, all of a sudden, uh, that night opens up and uh, the angels are there and there's the first Christmas program and uh, Christ is introduced. And uh, we thought, you know, at, at, especially at uh, November, December, end of November, first part of the, we got, we get so busy, don't we? Seems like every weekend and every day is taken up uh, with some kind of program or something to do or places to be. And, and we get so caught up with the hustle and bustle and we kind of lose what Christmas is about. What is Christmas about? What we want to do is uh, we're going to do Christmas in July. And we're going to walk through and uh, do some Christmas carols. We're going to talk about the very first Christmas. You know, they really don't know the exact day of it. Uh, why can't it be in July? Because it's 95 degrees, Brother Gary. <laughs> yeah, I got to admit, it's, uh, it's a little warm outside. But uh, we want to we talk about what Christmas is all about. It's really about uh, who God is and what God has done. When it comes to Christmas gift giving, God was the one who started it, and he gave the very best gift that he could. And so over the, uh, this uh, uh, next uh, few weeks, the uh, month of July, we want to do Christmas in July. If you have your Bibles, I want you to join with me in Luke chapter 2. Turn over to Luke chapter 2. In Luke chapter 2, we're going to talk about the perspective of what Christmas is about as we look at uh, up here today, uh, we're gonna, you're going to hear about uh, giving through the month, especially this passage from Luke. Uh, the angels come to bring great joy of uh, good news of great joy. And uh, you'll notice up here, we do this every year. We do the uh, shoe boxes for uh, Samaritan's Purse. I enjoy working and, pro- and, and uh, partnering together with this wonderful ministry that sends shoe boxes literally around the world to share about what Jesus Christ is all about in their life. It makes all the difference in the world. Several years ago, we had a girl from Bryan College who was at Bryan College because she got a shoebox, became a believer, went away to Bible college, came to this country, and, because, and it all started with a shoebox that somebody packed for her that made a difference in her life. And I thought, you know, we, our, church, our church can do a thousand shoeboxes. I have no doubt about that. It's just, again, we get so caught up with the busyness and the hustle and bustle when it comes time for the holidays that we just don't have time. I thought, what a, what a great time, summertime, when maybe the, the, the hardest thing we're going to do is do vacation or something like that. I thought, let's, let's put the focus on what it's all about. You know, we're created in the image of God, and God is the greatest gift giver ever. And I think we find our significance and importance when we are givers, not just receivers and takers, but givers. And uh, I want to challenge everyone. I like to challenge our entire church to do a Christmas box. Um, if you have a family of four, we'd love to see you do four Christmas boxes that are coming up. And what we're going to try and do is collect them here the first week or two of August. And uh, we're going to do it again uh, come October. But I just find that this time of the year we're not as busy. And I thought this would be a great time to be able to do shoe boxes for kids uh, uh, for Samaritan's Purse. And so I want you to pray about that. Uh, matter of fact, I want you to do more than just pray. I want you to be active when it comes to giving to make a difference in these kids' lives. Here in Luke chapter 2, today what we want to do is look at God's gift to you. God's gift to you. And he's the very one that started off Christmas gift giving. Let's look at what it says in verse 1, chapter 2. It says, And it came to pass in those days that a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be registered. That, that's just a fancy way of saying taxed. You ever notice how politicians sometimes can change words? You don't know what you're getting involved in. Register. That means they're going to tax them is what it means, all right? This census was first take, took place while Quirinus was governing Syria. So all went to be registered, everyone to his own city. Joseph also went up from Galilee out of the city of Nazareth unto Judea to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David. That's important. That's significant. Put a little star by that. We're going to come back to that in just a minute. Boy, this is convicting, isn't it, as I read? I'll tell you what. <laughs> it says, to be, to be registered with Mary, his betrothed wife, who was with child. So it was that while they were there, those days were completed for her to be delivered. And I want you to watch very carefully what it says in verse 7. And she brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes, laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the end. I find this very interesting. You know who wrote this book right here? Trick question, right? It's like who's buried in Grant's tomb, right? <laughs> Who wrote the book of Luke? Uh, 
Yeah, Luke, Luke wrote it. Do you remember what his occupation was? He's a doctor. He's a medical doctor. Obviously, he's going to talk about the kind of clothing that they would wrap Jesus in. He's very precise about that. Even what they would use as a cradle, that would be a manger, he's going to talk about that. But they wrapped him in swaddling clothes. So Dr. Luke is laying those things out for us in this passage. And I find it very interesting because he makes a very interesting point in verse 7 that a lot of times we go over and miss. Notice what it says. And she brought forth, not there. You would think it would say there, right? Their firstborn son. It's our firstborn son. Every time I go to the hospital and it's a, see a, a couple, which we had another baby yesterday, and we got a couple more on the way, all right? But uh, it was kind of interesting. It was, it was their baby. It was their firstborn baby. But it doesn't say there, does it? What's it say? And she brought forth her firstborn son. See, Joseph would end up being the stepfather of Jesus. J- Mary gave birth. See, she was a virgin, and she was with child. She tried to explain that to Joseph back in, in, in Matthew. Remember that? We're looking at that passage, Matthew chapter 1. And here he was. He, he thought, man, he's, he's being set up. And an angel appeared to him and reminded him of that verse that he learned in Awana when he was a real little kid. It said in, in, in the Old Testament that a virgin would conceive and bear a son. He had one verse to hang his, not only his life, but his hopes, everything upon was that one Bible verse. And here they are, they're going to Bethlehem. Now, this is important, this is very significant that they're going to Bethlehem right here. And she's going to give forth her firstborn son, bring forth her firstborn son. In this passage here, notice what it says in the very next passage, the next statement, verse 8. My friend, I want you to first of all see the weight of that night, the weight of that night. They get to Bethlehem, they have no place, it was crowded. By the way, it was crowded then, it's even more crowded today. Again, this is one of the reasons why we want to do Christmas in July. So our, our schedules don't get so crowded that we don't have time to fit Jesus into his own birthday. And then here in this passage, notice what it says in verse 8. Now there was in the same country, in, in Bethlehem, je- shepherds living out in the fields, keeping watch over their flocks by night. And behold, an angel of the Lord stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone round about them. And they were really excited about it. Now, what's it say? They were what? They were, t- they were so afraid. They were terrified. They were terrified. The weight of that night, the weight of that night is God has not spoken for over 400 years. For over 400 years. And when you look at the Old Testament, you see the, you see the, the prophetic passages and you see the, uh, the prophets who speak and you see the, the law that's given in the history and the poetry. And, and, and then all of a sudden at the, about 500 BC, the Bible's shut and it, it stops right there. No more words from God. None. And for over 400 years, he's been silent. And the very last words, the very last words that God gave in Malachi chapter 4, listen to what it says in Malachi chapter 4, verse 6. The very last statement of the Old Testament says this, lest I come and strike the earth with a curse. (laughs) Bible closed. Wow. That did not sound like they lived happily ever after, did it? (laughs) I mean, it starts off good. God creates everything. And he closes the book by saying, unless he comes and smites the earth with a curse. And here are these old shepherds out on a hillside working the graveyard shift, the midnight crew, right? And they're keeping watch over the sheep. And all of a sudden the skies roll back. And it's like this phenomenon. They've never seen this before. Now we do it all in our Christmas programs, right? Anybody ever been to a Christmas program? And they do the, do the whole play right there. I mean, we, we've done that. And it, you ever have something funny happen? And if, it's always amazing to me that anything that can go wrong will go wrong at a Christmas program. Like one year, I'll never forget, we were doing the shepherds and the wise men and Mary and Joseph. And, and it was kind of interesting because the, the wise men showed up before the shepherds at our program. <laughs> they were already down there and they realized they came too early. Shepherds hadn't even got down there yet and they're standing down front for the whole program. We even had one guy uh, who talked about uh, Jesus being born in Birmingham. See, his southern roots, uh, I think it's Bethlehem, okay? Bethlehem. But it's kind of, these guys have never seen anything like this. I mean, the skies roll back, and here comes an angel, and, and, and they are terrified. There's the wait. 400 years God hasn't spoken, and now he speaks. Now he speaks. What's he going to do? It's kind of interesting. Notice what it says. I want you to see the wonder of that night as well. Verse 10, the wonder of that night. Then the angel said to them, do not be afraid. For behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. Wow. This isn't a bad thing. 
I know it ended with a curse in the, in the Old Testament, but there, here's some good news that's coming. Because the whole Testament was the foundation for everything that's getting ready to happen. And, and it happened tonight. It begins tonight, this journey. The very first Christmas. The very first Christmas. So we see the weight and the wonder of that night. Notice what it says in uh, verse 11. For the, there is born to you this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. That statement right there is loaded. I mean, it's loaded right there. That statement right there, after he talks about the, uh, the weight of that night and here God speaks and he breaks through the clouds and comes up and, and they're terrified and the wonder is that they didn't come, he didn't come to bring a curse. He came to bring good tidings of great joy. And all of a sudden he makes, there's some words that are spoken that make claims to each and every one of our lives today. There are, these are the five claims of Christmas found in verse 11. Five claims of Christmas. These claims make a claim on your life. They make a claim on my life. They make a claim on everybody's life here today. The claims of Christmas. Notice what it says again in verse 11. For there is born to you this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. What I want to do is kind of look at this verse in the original language. Because the way it's laid out in the original language, is it's like a cadence, all right? Matter of fact, it literally says, born to you today, a Savior, Christ the Lord, in the city of David. That's exactly the cadence of it. The very first claim that God makes in our life from verse 11 is this. There's a claim. It says, born, born. And he finishes with the statement, really, in Bethlehem of Judea. That's significant. I told you all ago to put a little star by that. We're going to come back and look at that. But that little statement right there, born, this is a prophetic word. And I'll be quite frank, it ought, to, it ought to claim our attention, every one of us, our attention. Even if you're a hardened atheist, it ought to get your attention because this is what sets the Bible apart from every other religious book out there. Whether it's the Koran, the Pearl of Great Price, Superman comic books, whatever you worship, all right? This is what sets it apart is pro prophecy, fulfilled prophecy. Matter of fact, God's fingertips are all over this book right here. There's only one person who can predict the future and be 100% accurate, and it's the one who holds it in his hand. And that little statement right there just stuck up on us, born, born to you. Right off the bat, it's a prophetic word, and this ought to claim our attention. It ought to claim our attention. Because what he's saying is there's going to be a prophecy that's fulfilled in this passage right here. This was a prophecy that goes all the way back to the dawn of creation. And it's a prophecy. In here, he makes the statement, uh, born, uh, I'm sorry, verse 11, for there is born to you this day, and really at the very end of the statement of that verse, it says, uh, in the city of David. That's significant because here's the first prophecy. There's a prophecy that's given over in Micah 5, 2 that tells us where Jesus would be born, where Jesus would be born. Now, remember where they started from their journey? Where, where was Mary and Joseph living? They were living where? Nazareth. By the way, Nazareth is like the Las Vegas of today. You know, it's like Las Vegas, yeah. It, matter of fact, when, when, when the disciples are confronted and they said, he's Jesus of Nazareth, they said, what? Can anything good come out of Nazareth? You know, I mean, this, this is, okay. but here they are. Here's Mary and Joseph. They're in Nazareth. And they, they want to tax the world. One of the ways they do it is they register people. So you got to go to your home place. And, and Joseph and Mary are from the lineage of David. They're descendants of David. So they have to go to Bethlehem to be taxed, to do the register. And it's kind of interesting what, in essence, God is doing is he's going to fulfill a passage of Scripture right here. You see, the Old Testament tells us emphatically where the Messiah is going to be born. Later on, Herod would bring the uh, scribes and Pharisees in and, and play Bible trivia with them and say, I got a question for you. When, when the Messiah shows up, where is he going to be born at? And without any hesitation, they quote that Old Testament passage. Again, a prophetic passage. Pa passage that would be fulfilled right here by a couple who would never leave Nazareth, but they have to or they're going to be in trouble. So they have to get to Bethlehem somehow, some way. It's like a four or five day journey. And here she is. She's great with child. Great with child. Look what it says in Micah 5, 2. But you, Bethlehem, Ephrathah. And the reason he says Ephrathah, there were two Bethlehems back then. The one Ephrathah was in the south, right below Jerusalem. There was another one up north. <laughs> I've told you this before, but... What he's saying is Jesus is southern born. I know that would minister to you all. He's born in South Bethlehem. 
But you, Bethlehem, Ephrathah, though you are little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of you shall come forth to me the one to be ruler in Israel. What's that? That's the Messiah. That's a statement for the Messiah. And when the Messiah comes forth, look what it says. Whose going forth are from old, from when? From everlasting. Not only does it tell where he's going to be born, it tells what kind of person he's going to be. He's going to be an eternal being. He is the Son of God who has existed from eternity past. God is going to become a man. And in here, he tells us where he's going to be born. He's going to be born in Bethlehem. There's no way they're going to be, that's going to happen unless, unless they set up a tax system and they have to go to their own town and that's what happens. And they show up in Bethlehem. So it shows where the, he would be born in Bethlehem. He fulfills that prophecy. Another prophecy is how he would be born, how he would be born. Again, this ought to get our attention. How he would be born. You know, the very first prophecy in all scripture is found in Genesis chapter 3. It's after man sins that God comes looking for them. And in looking with them, he deals with the man because of his sin. He only gave them one commandment. Remember that? Just one. It one to ten commandments. It was the one commandment, right? You can eat of any tree in the garden, be any tree. Except one. The tree of knowledge of good and evil. And what did man do? He violated the one command that God gave to them. See, they listened to the lie that Satan gave. The lie was this. You will become as God. That's what a lot of religions teach out there. You become God. You can become as God. It was a lie to them. And because of that broken commandment, they hide themselves, but it's God who comes looking for them. And then God gives one, the very first prophecy in all scripture. It's found in Genesis 3.15. It says, and I will put enmity between you and the woman. He's talking to the, to the Satan right here in this passage. He says, I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. Did you notice that? In this passage right here, when he says between your seed, he's talking to the woman. That's the only time you'll see that in scripture. It's the seed of a woman. That's a reference to the virgin birth of Jesus Christ. I've shared this before. It's, there's the seed of Abraham, the seed of Isaac and Jacob and the seed of David, but never the seed of a woman except here in Genesis chapter three. It's the very first prophecy. Is that prophecy for real? Yeah, a little later on in Isaiah chapter seven, he would make the same statement. In Isaiah, he says, therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. Here's the sign. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear his son and you'll, you shall call his name what? Emmanuel. But does anybody know what that word means? You know, it's interesting. When you look at the Gospels, how they write them, Luke, Luke is writing and he's talking about the fulfillment of them being born in Bethlehem. <clears throat> but it's interesting, Matthew is the one that talks about um, his name would be called Emmanuel. And Matthew made sure that you would understand what this word means. If you, if you forgot what Hebrew was all about and you couldn't translate it, he says, he shall be called Emmanuel, which interpreted as God with us. God with us. This is a prophecy all the way back in the Old Testament. It talks about where he would be born. It talks about how he would be born. It even talks about when he would be born. It's interesting in Daniel chapter 9. In Daniel 9, you're dealt with uh, Daniel 70 weeks. And they're weeks of years, and we've studied this before. And while they wouldn't know the exact or precise date, they could kind of come pretty close. So much so that it was wise men from where? The east that came to see him. Where was that? Well, it's, it's pretty much assumed that they came from Babylon where, where Daniel was in captivity. And some people believe these wise men were the Kurds that are even there today. They had seen his star in the east and they had come. They had known what the scriptures had said. And they show up and they're the ones that show up. These are kings who come into to Jerusalem. And it says, and all Jerusalem's troubled and, and Herod's upset about it. And, and when they come before Herod, they just want to know, where's he that's born king of the Jews? The problem is, Herod happens to own that title right there. That's why it becomes troubling. And when Herod was troubled, heads began to roll, literally. And so all of Jerusalem is troubled with him. But there's a prophecy of where he would be born and how he would be born and when he would be born. Born, that's a prophetic word. Claims my attention. It ought to get your attention. Now that it says born, I love this, to you, to you. This is personal word. And it claims my affection. It claims my affection. Born to you. You know, when we read the Bible, sometimes we get caught up with some of the big words. 
I love John 3, 16, but sometimes you can get lost in that. For God so loved the world. The world, the whole world? Yes, he did. He loved the world. But it doesn't say me. That whosoever, again, that's a big time word, whosoever. I love this right here. When he comes that night, and those shepherds have no clue. They're, 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 the last words that God spoke, I'll smite the earth with a curse. And, and they roll back the skies. And the angel shows up. And it says, in the glory, I mean, it's just, everything is illuminated. It's like almost daylight right there. And they're terrified. And he says, no, no, don't worry about this. I, I, don't be afraid. I bring you glad tidings of great joy. And it's going to be to everybody. And he says this. I love this. Born to you. Those shepherds, those guys working the, the midnight crew, the graveyard shift. It was for them that night. You know, God could have came to anybody. He could have showed up to all the kings. He could have showed up the most glamorous place in the world. He does it. He shows up and sends his angels to a bunch of shepherds working the late night shift and says, born to you, to you. It was those shepherds on that night. Later on, it would be those wise men who came from the east seeking for him. It would also be to Herod. It would be, it would be to the people in Jerusalem who were troubled because uh, the wise men showed up. Friends, he would be born for you and for me as well. It's to each and every one of us. It's a personal word, and I love that. Born to you. Born to you. This claims my affection. My affection. God loves me. God loves people more than anything in this world. It's interesting. John says we love him first. We love him because he first loved us. He first loved us. Born to you, this is a personal word. And I love this. Born to you, and then the next word is today. Today. Well, what day was that? Well, and we got seven days a week, right? Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. It never says what day he was born on, does it? Well, somebody said, well, it was December the 25th. Well, we're not, we're not sure about that. Really don't know. There's a big debate on whether he's born at that time, and there's some good evidence for that. And some people say, no, he's born in September because the shepherds were out there keeping watch over the flock, and the flock wouldn't be out at nighttime and at, at, at Christmas time at Dece in December because it's too cold. Au contraire. <laughs> These weren't just any sheep that they were watching. These were the sheep in Bethlehem. These were the sheep that were offered up for a sacrifice. These sheep had to be without blemish, without spot, and without blemish. And so they would be a special kind of sheep. So they would be out at Christmas time. So what day was it? We, we don't know. We don't know if it was September, November, December. We just know this. He was born to you, and it was that day, today. You know, that's a perpetual word right there. It could be any day. It could be any day. And if it's any day, it claims my attitude. There's something about Christmas time that we're all a little different. Even the pagans are different at Christmas time. If you're from America and stuff like that, everybody's a little nicer at Christmas time, except at the shopping mall, okay? <laughs> you ever been there and some guy just sitting in the, like the third row, you know, right there, right next, it's like the third car in and the, and the, and the brake lights are on with the reverse lights? I've always thought that would be fun, get there early and get a nice parking space and just put your reverse lights on and just sit there. Watch people just get in the flesh, right? You ever been there? Come on now, come on now. We just have an invitation right now. When's you going to leave? You know, never. I'm just here for the enjoyment. <laughs> Listen to Christmas songs in there here in my car. Man, it's something about Christmas time that we're, you know what? We're a little more giving at Christmas time. You know, I told you at the very beginning that, that, that God wants to bring the best out of us. And when we're when we're giving people, we're more like him than we ever are because we're created in his image. Christmas has a way of bringing the best of us out. And while it may be December 25th, why, why can't it be Christmas in July? There's no reason why it can't be Christmas in July. I was talking to someone here um, the other day and we were talking about this and they said, for that very reason of all the hustle and bustle at Christmas time, he said, they're, singing, they're sending out Christmas cards this month. The friends of theirs. That'll get your attention, won't it? It's like, what, this got lost in the mail, right? <laughs> when was it supposed to, you know, and then you find out uh, all they're doing is celebrating Christmas in July. There's nowhere it says, and, and the question is this, why can't it be Christmas every day of the year? Why is it just got to be December 25th? I read an article several years ago in one of the editorials, and it was from a nursing home, and a nurse said, hey, listen, I don't want to damper anybody. I throw cold water, but the Christmas baskets, they're a little overwhelming at Christmas time. 
When you walk into a room and there's 10 Christmas baskets of fruits and vegetables, they're just, it's just, they're going to be run. Why, why can't, instead of everybody bringing in a Christmas or a fruit basket at, at Christmas time, why don't you stretch it out? Why don't someone bring it at Christmas, someone bring one in February. Let, let Christmas be February the 14th, Valentine's Day. It's going to be Christmas this year. Let it be June the 12th. Let it be July the 4th. No, that's my birthday. I can't do that. No, but uh, let it be whenever to make a difference in other people's lives. And he says, born to you today, any day, it can be Christmas. It can be Christmas. And this claims my attitude, having the right kind of attitude. Born to you today, notice what he says next, a savior. That's a purposeful word. It lets us know why Jesus Christ came. If you had any questions why Jesus Christ came to this world, world, all you have to do is read the Gospels and find out. Listen, very frankly, Jesus was born to die. His whole purpose. It's kind of interesting when you look at the gifts that the wise men came, the gold, frankincense, and myrrh. They actually deal with his life. And one of the gifts that were given was a gift that's used to embalm people. Gold is always something you give to a king, right? If you ever have doubts about what to give a king, gold's always a good choice, right? Gold, frankincense, and, and myrrh. And Jesus was born to die. Every Old Testament prophecy, even the very first prophecy that was given, said that one day, someday, Satan would, that Jesus would come and he would crush the head of Satan, but Satan would bruise his heel. Jesus would be wounded. He says that in Isaiah 53, he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The whole reason Jesus came was to be the Savior of the world. And every Old Testament sacrifice, every time they offered a lamb up, a sheep up, they recognized they didn't know how God was going to do it, but they knew someday, one day, God would deal with the sin question. And they were trusting in what God would do. And then when Jesus shows up, who is the Son of God, an eternal being, fulfilling Old Testament prophecies. John the Baptist looks at him and points him out and says, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. He's our Savior. And this, this claims our adoration. It claims our adoration to bow with bended knee to him who loves me that he would give his life so that I might have life and have it more abundantly. Notice what it says next. Born to you today, a Savior who is Christ the Lord. That statement, Christ the Lord, is a powerful statement right there. Because up to that point, we don't know who he is. We just know he's a baby born to Mary and Joseph. Really just to Mary. He's born in a place called Bethlehem. That's kind of clicking off, you know, the checklist right there. Going through virgin born checklist. But who is he? He's Christ the Lord. That's powerful. It means he can back up his claims. Whatever his, what are his claims? I am the way, the truth, and the life. And no one comes to the Father but by me. The only way you ever get to heaven is through Jesus Christ. You know, it's kind of interesting. We see uh, the adoration that's claimed, but because he's Christ the Lord, it demands an answer. It claims an answer from each and every one of us. We have to make a decision who we're going to follow. And when we take the message of good tidings of great joy, which are to all people, and those little kids open up a Christmas box, they're going to be confronted with, they have to make a decision. He has to have an answer. Is he Lord and Savior of your life? He's Christ the Lord. You know, when you think of Christmas, I hate to say this, but we get caught up with the Christmas lights, don't you? I like them. I like Christmas lights. I like to go around on a great quest looking for some of the best lights, right? But sometimes they're distractions for us. You know what the first Christmas was all about? It wasn't lights. It was little feet right there. There it is. There's your gift. God's gift to you. Born to you today, a Savior who's Christ the Lord. Jesus was born to die. The Bible makes it very clear that the wages of sin is death. But then it says this, but the gift of God. There it is. Those little feet right there. The gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Let's pray together. With heads bowed and eyes closed. You know, the most important decision you'll ever make is what will you do with Jesus Christ? What will you do with him? Here we are in July. We're celebrating and looking at Christmas. 